Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shane Squark, and on behalf of the Market Technicians Association, I'd like to welcome you back to another webcast as part of the MTA's Educational Web Series. Today, on June 13, 2012, we are joined by Jack Shanniff as he presents the evolution of Dow theory for the 21st century. Jack Shanniff is a West Point graduate, former Air Force flight instructor, and started in the finance business over 50 years ago with Dean Witter. He retired as Senior Vice President at age 50. Jack has been writing the Shanup Timing Indicator and the DowTheory.com newsletter since 1977, originally just for colleagues in the business and since 1998 on the Internet. He is also the author of Dow Theory for the 21st Century, published by John Wiley and Sons in 2008. As always, we welcome your questions throughout the entire webcast. Today we will be having two question and answer periods, a short one of which will take place in approximately 15-20 minutes, and the second which will take place towards the end of the session. As a reminder, registration for the October 2012 CMT exams is now open. All three levels of the exam will take place on Saturday, October 20th. In order to ensure your preferred location, we strongly encourage that you register as soon as possible. And without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Jack Shannon. Thank you, Shane, not only for the nice introduction, but for inviting me on behalf of the Market Technicians Association to be here today. I also appreciate your help in setting up this webinar. And thanks to the members of the MTA and our guests from around the country and around the world, for that matter, for joining us today. And welcome to the evolution of the Dow Theory for the 21st century. Today I'm going to share some of my 50 plus years experience in the stock market business as we explore the original Dow Theory, which has served us so well for over 100 years, after which I'll show you what I've added to it for the 21st century. If you have any questions, I hope you will submit them as they arise, as I want to cover them after the early part of this presentation, being sure that we're all on the same page before going on with the evolution into the 21st century. And then we'll cover additional questions before wrapping up with the current status of the Dow Theory. The evolution of the Dow Theory starts in the 19th century with Charles H. Dow, of course. A farm boy from Connecticut, a newspaper reporter, he's remembered for several major accomplishments. He co-founded Dow Jones & Company, publisher of, at that time, the Customer's Afternoon Letter which became the Wall Street Journal, of course, where he served as first editor. He originated the Dow Jones Industrial Average in 1896. Originally 12 leading smokestack companies, the index has grown, and today it's comprised of 30 blue-chip leading corporations with very few smokestacks among them. But to this day, his stock average answers the question, what did the market do today? A year later, he created the railroad average because the rails were the primary transportation mode of the day. It was said that what the industrials make, the transports take. Thus, they are intertwined. Henry Ford was yet to manufacture a Model A, and the Wright brothers were yet to fly. But shortly thereafter, they would. And later, the index would add trucking, airlines, sea transport, and delivery services to the rails and the name would change to the Dow Jones Transportation Average. Watching his stock averages move with the business cycle and observing trends, Dow began to formulate his theory, yet to be named by others as Dow's theory, which he saw as a barometer of business conditions. He recognized that if the stocks in his indices were going up, that pointed to future business being good, and vice versa. If they were going down, it was pointing to uh, poor future business and per perhaps a recession. As you well know, his theory became the basis for technical analysis. He was quite a guy. Last November, I was invited to speak at the Museum of American Finance as your Market Technicians Association in conjunction with the MTA Educational Foundation and Dow Jones Indexes celebrated his 160th birthday. It was quite a tribute. Let's see, I think I hit the wrong button, but we'll fix that in a second. We want to go on to, we want to move here into the uh, 20th century. 
moving right along. Charles Dow compared the stock market to the tides of the ocean when he wrote the following. And I start my book with this quote, as I think it's the very epitome of his theory, and I'll read it if you don't mind. A person watching the tide coming in and who wishes to know the exact spot which marks the high tide sets a stick in the sand at the points reached by the incoming waves until the stick reaches a position where the waves do not come up to it and finally recede enough to show that the tide has turned. This method holds good in watching and determining the flood tide of the stock market. If you think of the Dow Jones Industrial Average as being the measure of the tide on one part of the beach and the Dow Jones Transportation Average as a measure on another part of the beach, both used to determine that the tide is indeed coming in or going out all along the seashore rather than rogue waves in one place or the other, you'll understand what Dow was getting at. Confirmation by both is required to create a signal. Charles Dow died before he could complete the description of his theory. He never really clarified it, nor actually named it, and unfortunately never wrote a book on his theory. Dow's successor at the Wall Street Journal, William Peter Hamilton, editorialized on Dow's thoughts and did write a book, The Stock Market Barometer, in 1922. Hamilton's most famous editorial was A Turn in the Tide, published in 1929. Unfortunately, he passed away shortly thereafter, so missed seeing the results of that most amazing Dow Theory cell signal. In the early 1930s, an investor named Robert Ray, who was disabled and bedridden, had the time and inclination to analyze the work of Dow and Hamilton and set out to codify what we now know as the Dow Theory in his book by the same name. Robert Ray set out a few hypotheses that he said must be accepted without reservation whatsoever if one is to use the theory successfully. Let's see what those are. Manipulation is possible in the day-to-day -day movements of the averages. Secondary reactions are subject to such an influence in a more limited degree, but the primary trend can never be manipulated. Two, the averages discount everything. Fluctuations of the daily closing prices of the Dow Jones rail and transport average afford a composite index of all the hopes, disappointments, and knowledge of everyone who knows anything of financial matters. For that reason, the effects of coming events, excluding acts of God, are always properly anticipated in their movement. And finally, three, and this is for the lawyers in the room, and I heartily subscribe to this one, the theory is not infallible. It's not an infallible system for beating the market. Its successful use as an aid in speculation requires serious study, and the summing up of evidence must be impartial. The wish must never be allowed to father the thought. The three movements of the stock market are first, and most important, the primary trend, which consists of the broad upward or downward movements known as bull or bear markets, and may be of several years duration. The most important factor in successful speculation is the correct determination of the direction of this movement. There is, unfortunately, no known method of forecasting the extent or duration of a primary movement. Dean Witter Publications used to say, the genius of investing is in recognizing the direction of a trend, not catching the highs and lows. Second, and the most deceptive movement is the secondary reaction, which is an important decline in a primary bull market or a rally in a primary bear market. These reactions usually last, and I repeat, and I repeat usually, three weeks to as many months, and generally, repeat generally, retrace one-third to two-thirds of the primary price change. These reactions are frequently erroneously assumed to represent a change of primary trends. Sometimes, of course, they do represent a change of the tide. The third and usually unimportant movement is the daily fluctuation, although that's all the 24-hour cable networks ever seem to want to talk about. The Dow theory is used to identify major changes in the direction of the market, the primary movement. 
resulting in what are essentially buy and sell signals. Here's an example of such a signal. The classic buy signal is developed as follows. After the low point of a primary downtrend is established, point number one on this graph, this is where the sticks in the sand come into play, a secondary uptrend rally or bounce will occur. Another stick in the sand at point number two. A review of Dow theory signals implies that a secondary trend will usually bounce at least 4% on both the industrials and the transports, and usually one or both will exceed 7%, but these percentages are not written into the theory. William Peter Hamilton described secondary reactions variously as lasting from a few days to many weeks, also from 20 days to 60 days, and numerous other combinations. It's no wonder there are so many interpretations of the Dow theory. After the bounce, a pullback on one of the averages, which must exceed 3%, according to Robert Ray, and then hold above the prior lows on both the industrials and the transport at point number three. Finally, a breakout above the previous rally high by both the transport and the industrials at uh, point number four constitutes a buy signal for what is hoped to be a developing bull market. There are lots of variations possible. This classic buy is simply that, the standard by which a buy signal is given. But, very, but variations exist where the signals can be given, introducing additional reasons for differing, for differing interpretations. Now let's look at a real world example. Here we are in uh, August 1998, market's been in a decline, looks like we're at a market low. We don't know that, but we put a stick in the sand. So far in the weeks ahead, it looks like uh, maybe it's going to hold. I'm sorry, we, we, I've gotten ahead of myself again here. Bear with me. Okay, we were looking for the uh, lows to hold. They, they appear to have done that. We're also looking for a bounce that will last uh, usually three weeks, maybe three months. Um, and we got that from uh, 831, August 31st, to uh, September 23rd. So we've got a qualifying secondary reaction, possibly a new primary trend. We'll have to see about that. Next thing that needs to happen is that pullback of over 3%. In this case, it was 6.4%, and it is holding barely uh, above the uh, sticks in the sand there at number one. And finally, it goes back up through point number two above the bounce high, and uh, that would appear to be a breakout, and that would be a Dow theory, right? Dow theory buy? Not so fast. We need to look at the, trans the transports for confirmation. And here are the transports. Um, after the lows are established at point number one, and note those dates do not have to occur on the same date, we had a bounce to number two. Incidentally, the transports only rose for, thir uh, for 19 days, which led some theorists to dismiss the bounce. Then the pullback number three, where in this case the transports did not hold their lows, but they did eventually go on to establish a higher high at point number four, a couple of weeks after the Dow did. And so it turns out this is not a classic buy signal, but a typical variation, the almost classic, I call it, buy signal 8706. In all cases, we use the closing price of any index, not the more volatile interday movement. If it doesn't close there, it doesn't count. The classic sell signal for uh, going into a bear market is, of course, the same rules. It's just inverted. Um, when a bull market tops and sets back, the subsequent rally then goes back up again over 3%, falls short of reaching the previous high, and then penetrates the recent lows on the next decline as measured by both the industrials and the transports a sell signal would be generated and a probable bear market to follow. So the classic sell is outlined market highs at one, pullback at two, bounce to below the highs at three, and a breakdown below the pullback level at four. 
Since Ray's work in the early 1930s, Charles Dow's theory has remained largely, if not totally, unchanged. And yet it has a fine track record. While no two Dow theorists ever seem able to agree on each and every signal given, we believe that our interpretation of the original Dow theory results in an 11.82% compounded annual increase since December 31 of 1953. The full 100 years would have been similar, but our current database happens to cover these recent 58 years, and I'll explain why that is in a few minutes. This compares to a buy and hold strategy by which the Dow Industrials grew during the same period at 10.4% rate with dividends reinvested. For whatever time period you look at, the original Dow theory seems to outperform buy and hold by 1 or 2% a year, uh, as I say, during most any period. This chart shows the hypothetical compound return of $1,000 invested in December 31, 1953, with a buy and hold in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which would have grown to 310603 While utilizing our interpretation of the original Dow theory, we would have grown to 651824 over the same time period. 11.82% versus 10.4% doesn't sound like much, but it makes quite a difference with the power of compounding. The results of the Dow theory have not gone unnoticed, as you see from this quote from Mark Holbert of Holbert Financial Digest, who follows 180, 200 different stock market newsletters, and he indicates that the Dow theory is one of the best performing market timing systems of the last decade. Okay, how's our time going? It looks like we're on schedule. Do we have any questions at this point? I want to make sure we're all on the same page before going forward. Okay, we've got a question here. On the buy signal, wouldn't the lower low on number three on the transports negate the move? No, as I said, this is a typical variation where one violates the low but not the other and eventually the one that violated the low does come forward and uh, reconfirm by moving ahead of the, uh, of the last bounce. If you have any more questions on this first segment, now is the time to ask them. Um, otherwise, we're going to move right on in in the continuing evolution. Uh, evolution. Uh, what is the current read of the Dow theory? We're going to uh, save that for the end. So you're going to have to hang on a while. Sorry about that. OK. Anything else to talk about now? Good. We're all together on this. Let's, uh, let's proceed. Robert Ray wrote in his 1932 classic, The Dow Theory, that its usefulness improves with the passage of time. He said that those who use it 20 years later, that would be 1952, would have a greater advantage. And here we are 80 years later, and indeed we do have a much greater advantage. The fundamentals of a theory stay the same as in 1932. However, with faster communications, more historical data available, and more tools like computers, there are certain advantages that we have today in 2012. And the first one is capitulation. Capitulation is a word that neither Charles Dow, William Hamilton, nor Robert Ray ever uttered as far as I can find. But it's what they were alluding to, as Ray wrote here, the third phase of a bear market caused by distressed selling of sound securities, regardless of their value, by those who must find a cash market for at least a portion of their assets, after a market has drastically declined and then goes into a semi-panic collapse, it is wise to cover short positions. Well, <laughs> I might add that it would be wise if you'd been short. And then he goes on to say, and even perhaps make commitments for long account. But unfortunately, that was not incorporated into Dow's theory. I describe it as it relates to the stock market as when investors, speculators, whomever, throw in the towel because they're so disheartened, fearful, need to meet margin calls, or whatever. It's often called a selling climax as stocks cascade down into a cataclysmic sell-off. 
And that is when we start to buy. Capitulation is incorporated into our interpretation of the Tao theory for the 21st century. I know you're asking, and how do we know when that is? When I was a young stockbroker, there was a computer assistance to research department that made all sorts of calculations and permutations on momentum in the stock market. And out of that, I later recognized a configuration that pinpointed capitulation. A short-term oscillator is utilized, which measures the percent of divergence between the major stock market indices, that is, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500, and the New York Stock Exchange Composite, and their exponentially time-weighted moving averages. This table is from a paper I submitted in your Market Technician Association's Charles H. Dow Award Competition in uh, 2005 where I did a comparison with seven other indicators, which I had identified as possibly being capable of making such an identification of capitulation. The results are clear. My indicator was the best more times than any other, had no extraneous or false signals, importantly. And up to the current time, there are only 15 times it has occurred over the last nearly 60 years that are database covers. Not all bear markets end in capitulation. Some end with a whimper. But the last eight did end with an identifiable capitulation. The following charts show the 15 times we have identified capitulation, from the, one, from the ones that are shown here up to today. The database that has the calculations and permutations that are needed in identifying capitulation was not started until 1968. Therefore, I inputted back 15 years to uh, 1953 to see what might have turned up. And this was the first and only capitulation that, that occurred in our database dating back to then. So it was back tested here. In 1970, uh, for this chart and going forward, we did have the data necessary to identify capitulation on a real-time basis, although we hadn't yet recognized what we had. May 1970 was when the anti-Vietnam War activity led to the shooting at Kent State University. Sometimes there's outside news, sometimes not. Capitulation doesn't always occur right at the bottom, as this chart will attest. This was the first of four times that we had double capitulations in the same bear market bottoming process. This was the month President Nixon resigned, August of 1974, and afterwards. I started my market newsletter in 1977 as a private correspondence to my brokers and colleagues in the business. And the first capitulation that occurred after that was the crash of 87. This time, in my letter, I outlined the previous capitulations that we just covered. And this is showing the Dow Jones Industrial Average, as the others have. The first capitulation happened to be at the low on the DJIA. The second one was at the uh, S&P low. And the morning after that, I wrote in a letter going out at that time by snail mail. They say no one rings a bell at market lows. You've all heard that one. Well, I was so confident in my indicator to go on and say, but listen closely, I just did. The market then rose 72% into 1990. And in 1990, there was a short bear market. August was the month that uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And in January and February, over at the right side, you'll see that the market was celebrating our success in Desert Storm. Led I say proudly, by my West Point classmate and friend, General Norm Schwarzkopf. In 1998, well, you might keep this chart in mind as it covers the bear market bottom out of which I described the traditional Dow theory by previously. I'll get back to this one and show how we actually improved on that signal in a few minutes. In uh, late 1998, I opened my letter up on the internet 
and moving into the 21st century, the first signal was uh, another excellent signal following 9-11. Four days before this capitulation, we had advised our subscribers by email of the market levels which would qualify as capitulation, and of course sent out an email on September 20th entitled, Today we got total capitulation and should be used to buy. Yes, the numbers that come together to define capitulation can be determined in advance, and it's possible to buy at the close on that day. 2002 was a rather unusual double capitulation. You may remember the news was on again, off again, as Iraq's nuclear capabilities and aims and Americans' plans to invade were also on again, off again. On both occasions, we sent out emails. And on the day of the second capitulation low, we sent out one entitled, Only Twice in 50 Years, and Now Today, pointing out 1974 and 1987 had also been double capitulations and the favorable results that followed those occasions. A five-year bull market started the next day. And then in the, here we are moving forward. Did I miss, excuse me just a second. Let's see if I'm on the right one here. No, there was 02. Okay, we've done that one, moving ahead here. Uh, 08, I'm sorry, we did skip that. Here we have the Lehman Brothers collapse in September and the aftermath. I'm sure you're all familiar with that one. Following the lows in November of 08, although it's not evident on this chart, there was a 20% rise into 2009. It was 24% on the S&P. The significance of that will become apparent in a few minutes. Uh, in 2009, then, the market rolled over, the downtrend resumed, down 20% on the industrials, and actually 27% on the S&P, uh, with the low signal once again by capitulation. And finally, last summer was our last capitulation. Nine of these total 15 signals that we've just reviewed have occurred within 2% of the lows, as this one did. So I think you can see why we use capitulation to start buying. And it happens that a traditional Dow Theory buy signal has followed every time. Therefore, when capitulation occurs, we begin buying with a 25% position. I feel that the time parameters used by the Dow Theory when it was de devised early in the 20th century needed to be updated to reflect the realities of the 21st century, and I've made those improvements in my book, Dow Theory for the 21st Century, Technical Indicators for Improving Your Investment Results. Anyone who's read Alvin Toffler's Future Shock or the Third Wave knows that things happen faster now than they used to. Charles Dow himself at one time used 10 days as the minimum time for a secondary reaction, and that's good enough for me. I use 10 days minimum instead of three weeks to as many months. Actually, I shorten it to half of that when there's been a capitulation. By 25% of capitulation, then after the qualifying bounce, add 25% on the pullback, and the final 50% at the breakout to new highs, resulting in a buy signal which is lower and therefore better than the traditional Dow theory, which only bought at the breakout. My studies have shown that the broader S&P 500 index, which Charles Dow didn't unfortunately did not have available to him, would have been a better trigger than the traditional Dow theory in conjunction with the industrials and the transports. And therefore, I use it as the pre preeminent index, which must be confirmed by one of the other two, the transports or the industrials, to complete a signal. And finally, just in case the Dow theory is getting bogged down in completing its signal in a timely fashion, I've added our definition of a bear or bull market as a stop loss or a stop buy to complete the signal for the reasons shown above. Plus 19% and minus 16% are reciprocal numbers. Unlike the commonly used plus 20% and minus 20%, which are not. 
you all know that a 20% loss from 10,000 to 8,000 takes a 25% gain to get back to 10,000. Also, after the market has risen 19%, it then goes on 93% of the time to at least a plus 29% gain. After a minus 16% loss, it then goes on 90% of the time to at least a minus 24% loss. And 93% of the time, a recession follows. Dow's theory was meant to be a barometer of business, and we still want it to be. Requiring the 20% decline missed three recessions that our 16% definition caught. Now, let's look back at the real-world example where the traditional Dow theorists, <laughs> all of us for that matter, were looking for a market low. We have an apparent market low. As we remember from before, we put the sticks in the sand and hope it doesn't go further down. But we knew something at the time that the rest of the world didn't, or most of the rest of the world didn't, and that was that there was a capitulation on that day. So we began, under our rules of engagement, buying 25% at 7539.07. And then we had, of course, as you'll remember, a bounce. In this case, we only require 10 days, actually five days, because we've had capitulation. And we did get a bounce into uh, September 8th, which qualified. Oh, I've done it again. Uh, we got the bounce. All right, there we are. Now we're looking for a pullback, and we do. We get a, a pullback in excess of 3%, and we do require that the pullback be more than a one-day wonder. Uh, we all saw the flash crash. Don't want something like that to interfere with our signal. So we had a two-day pullback. That's part of the rule for the Dow theory for the 21st century, and after that, we got a breakup on the upside above the bounce. That would appear to be a buy. Uh, but in this case, we're looking at the S&P 500, and we need confirmation from either the industrials or the transport. Whenever we get near a signal like this, I make a table such as this. And the first line is where the market lows occur. When the uh, sticks in the sand finally hold, that's the market low. In this case, we got capitulation that same day. So over on the left side, we bought 25%. The next thing we looked for was the bounce. We got it on all three uh, indices here. And then the 3% pullback, which actually was uh, 4 and 5%. So that qualified. And then the breakout, which we just saw on the S&P 500 uh, on the 14th, was confirmed on the 14th by the transports. Never mind, the uh, industrials over at the left did not confirm until the next day, but they did rise through 8,020 uh, the next day. So on the 14th, we completed our position by buying another 50%, making us uh, fully invested. If there had been a second capitulation, as we've seen previously, we would have added another 25% along the way. So when the... Uh, Breakup was confirmed. We completed the purchase up to 100%, and our average entry level here was 77.61. So there you have it. Here's an overview of what happened um, during that time frame. The previous bull market high had occurred at uh, 93.37, and there had been a Dow Theory sell at 84.87. Incidentally, that was signaled by both the traditional Dow Theory and the Dow theory for the 21st century on the same day. Sometimes that happens. Uh, shallow bear market uh, was followed by buys in the following order. One was our Dow theory for the 21st century buy at 77.61 average. Then the uh, almost classic Dow theory, which we went through earlier at 87.06. The next thing coming in, the horizontal line from the left, and that is 19% advance was met on both the uh, industrials and the S&P 500 at 89.75. A bit later, one Dow Thirst I know of who wanted a more classic uh, buy signal, he wanted more than uh, 19 days on the uh, transports, finally got the uh, qualifying 
secondary reaction he was looking for, and he came in with a buy at 95.45. Now, the next up arrow at 11,000 and uh, where are we? 11,014 was a buy signal recognized by two well-known Dow theory letters. And what happened there was they were waiting for the transports to make all-time highs, which the industrials had done back in December. And consequently, they were uh, a little late to the, to the show. I think that's one reason the Dow theory doesn't get the respect it's due. Too many theorists follow 1932 rules without using the advantage of time that we've had over the last 80 years to improve on their interpretation. Incidentally, this whole episode was written up in a very interesting piece on thestreet.com in April of 1999 by Aaron Task and can still be accessed from a link at the bottom of our website. If you go to www.thedowtheory.com and don't forget thedowtheory.com, otherwise you'll get a friendly competitor's website and you'll see a link to the uh, article on thestreet.com. I think you'll find, find it worth reading. It gives names, places, times, dates. I would expect similar results going forward, but as I said before, the third hypothesis of Charles Dow's theory as set, up, set out by Robert Ray 80 years ago is still valid. The Dow theory is not an infallible system for beating the market. Here's the chart that you've seen before with the uh, buy and hold at 10.4% and the uh, original Dow theory at 11.82%. We put in the Dow theory for the 21st century as if it were in existence throughout the whole period. And if you were following the rules outlined in my recent book, unfortunately, all of those were not available uh, during all of that time. But there would have been a 14% annualized gain if the rules laid out had been followed from, from the beginning. These results uh, would have been obtained using our current rules of engagement, but they are back-tested, as you know, before the late 1960s, the necessary data was not available, and our capitulation indicator was not recognized until after I started my newsletter in 1977. That was, however, 25 years ago. And for a compound look, at these relatively small differences, you see that uh, time and small differences make a big difference in the results. Here, our interpretation of the original Dow theory uh, had twice the buy and hold results. Dow theory for the 21st century, 26, I'm sorry, <laughs> don't get carried away, six and a half times the buy and hold results. Take your pick. We think the choice is clear. And these results have not gone unnoticed either. Again, this is from Mark Holbert writing in Market Watch, and uh, I've taken the liberty of underlining that uh, our interpretation of the Dow theory was better than any of the 200 other strategies. Let's hear it for the Dow theory. And now a short commercial. Uh, all that we've discussed today and much, much more is available in my book, Dow Theory for the 21st Century. The book is available at Amazon.com, elsewhere, hopefully a bookstore near you. Another short commercial, if you don't mind, would be for my market letter. Of course, our indicators are kept up to date, and our current outlook appears in our monthly newsletter, which, incidentally, has the highest rating of active gurus by CXO Advisory. That's a good place to check out your favorite gurus, cxoadvisory.com. And by the way, our website has a lot of free information, and I invite you to uh, take a look at it. Before we get to the current outlook, which I know some of you are looking forward to, we do have time for um, some more questions. So let's see what's come in while, uh, while we've been talking. Uh, <laughs> sir, I'm a former A-10 pilot, so I'm a little slow. Can you <laughs> define capitulation again? 
Oh, well, let me see if I can talk pilot talk with you. Uh, it's been a long time since I've flown. But um, as I say, when the market is in a decline and just seems to be getting worse and no bottom in sight, and you start hearing gurus and uh, other people on the uh, financial news talk about are we going to 5,000, uh, 3,000, or 1,000, uh, and people are frightened and they're just selling stocks, they cannot stand to lose anymore, then that's when you get capitulation. Uh, let's see. I suppose the label for almost classic signal should read 1999. He's saying, well, let me see what, why that would be. Mm. That was slide number 26. I'll just take a quick second to look at that and see if anything pops up on what we're talking about. Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't follow you on that. I, I think it's been labeled properly. Okay, with the current markets being so news-driven and driven by politics rather than basic market fundamentals, with the debt system that exists. Are the Dow theory for the 21st century as applicable? Well, we would hope so. Um, there are certain human ingredients, fear and greed, that last through the ages, and uh, I think they're still in play today. So uh, uh, I, I have no reason to think anything will be changing here today. I will repeat that each and every signal will not be absolutely correct, but in the long run, the record's there, and I'm going to go with that. Uh, let's see. Hi, Jack. Perhaps I missed part. Uh, if you've not gone through your three indicators, could you please identify them? Well, that that comes, of course, from my market letter, which is called the Shanup Timing Indicator and the DowTheory.com. So obviously there is such a thing as the Shanup Timing Indicator, which also was derived from that database, which I mentioned earlier. And I have put the two of them together into uh, what we call a composite timing indicator. And Holbert has followed each of those for uh, 10 years now. And it happens in the last five years, he, uh, he also assigned uh, that when you sell out on a sell signal, you go to cash. He also indicated that if you sell, you could go short in the Shanup timing and the Dow theory. So he shows five portfolios for us in the last five years. And in that time frame, all of our five portfolios are in the top 19 out of 142 that he follows. And of course, they all outperform uh, buy and hold. Are the uh, capitulation computations shared in the book? Yes, I should have mentioned that that paper that I submitted to the market technicians uh, low that seven years ago is probably in your files somewhere. But it's also in my book, in total, with the, the statistics to back it up. Uh, and it's also on our website for uh, subscribers, of course. Uh, here's an interesting question. Is there a scenario where you use a double top capitulation to sell? Unfortunately, there's not. Uh, market tops are hard to determine, as I'm sure most of you recognize. And there is no alternative that I know of to our uh, capitulation in terms of market tops. Uh, how can I apply the capitulation approach to Asian equity markets where there aren't market averages, uh, where there are market averages, but only a broad single market index? I'm sorry, but uh, confirmation is a big part of this. And uh, I have seen studies in the U.S. where they have used uh, the NASDAQ or the uh, Internet uh, Index, uh, but um, I, I'm not sure what you'd use for confirmation in, in, in Asia. And there also is a question here on how it would apply to foreign markets, for example, Canada, Europe, and Asia. I know there are people uh, applying the Dow theory uh, in those regions. And as I say, what they're using in place of a transportation average, uh, I'm not sure. Do I see cycles of four years associated with the theory? Well, there are definite four-year patterns, as, as you know. 
if you go to our, our website in the free part, there is a history of uh, bull and bear markets, and there was a very evident period where bear market lows were every four years. But uh, that's not always the case, and I, you know, I depend on history, but I frankly don't like to hang my hat on just one thing like that. Did the transport typically lag the industrials? No, as a matter of fact, uh, it's been my experience that more times than not the transports uh, lead. And uh, they typically are more uh, volatile. So you'll get a, a 5 or 6 or 7% move out of the transports when you're only getting a 2, 3, or 4 part, 4% uh, from the S&P or the uh, Dow Industrials. Well, <laughs> Here's a question who, uh, once you retire from your newsletter, will BART be continuing it? Uh, I, I have two sons in the brokerage business now, uh, BART with his own business, Southwestern Investment Advisors in Tucson, and, and Tim with CBEZ, in, uh, both are financial advisors in Tucson, Arizona. And I am hoping to carry on for some time, but I'm also hoping that uh, one or the other of the young men will take over between them and me, we do have about 100 years of experience, and frankly, it seems a shame for that to be wasted uh, just because I go on to better things. Okay, we've got a couple of more minutes, a couple of more questions, and then we'll wrap it up with uh, where we are now. And what's the current read? Just a second, we'll get to that. And uh, I... Looks like we've answered uh, everything that's come in. If if not, uh, I understand I'll have an ability to uh, uh, pull up the questions and get back to anyone that we didn't have time for. And uh, also, if you didn't get an answer and you think of it later, send me an email at uh, my email address is editor at the Dow Theory dot com or Shannon at the Dow .com. I might even get janitor at the Dow .com. I'm not sure, but I prefer editor or shanup at the Dow .com. Okay, that appears to be uh, all the questions that we have, so let's uh, take a look at the uh, current status, wrap it up with that. It was a chart a little bit hard to uh, read. I put together to show that uh, we had uh, the transportations topped back there in the 1st of February. And after that happened, the S&P 500 went higher and the Dow Industrials went higher. And that's a divergence. And sometimes divergence is a sign of trouble ahead. Uh, not always. In fact, the transports almost broke out to new highs a couple of times, but they never did. Now, what occurred over the next couple of months was a line formed, which Dow refers to in his book as basically a tight trading range, 2 or 3% either side of a certain level. The transports, in fact, did trade 155 points either side of 5,200. The industrials, 275 points either side of uh, 13,000. And a number of Dow theorists, felt a sell signal was given when that trading range was broken on the downside. Certainly, that was an ominous sign, but that fact alone was not the reason for a sell. There had not been any previous setbacks which qualified as a secondary reaction. If you look at that S&P 500 top, the first part of April, there was a sharp sell-off, but it was only five days and that didn't qualify. But in May, there was a 17-day drop along with the almost three-month drop in the um, Dow Transports that did qualify. I would think for the traditional Dow theory, it was just short of three weeks, but with the transports just short of three months, that should have qualified, and it certainly did by our 10-day minimum for a secondary reaction. After that, the transports rallied 5.4%, qualifying as a 3% bounce, and then all three rolled over and made new highs for a sell signal. While the Dow theory does not forecast either the duration or extent of a bull or bear market, our studies of our historical data suggest that a bona fide bear market, that is to say 16% on both the S&P and the Dow industrials, follows about 60% of the time, 
and the median drop is an additional 12% from the cell signal. And a recession follows about 40% of the time. So this signal should not be taken lightly. And now, as always, we look forward to the next setup for the next buy, which may occur with capitulation. Hopefully that would make it easy to identify, or it may not. Uh, we shall see. And there you have it. Uh, I hope that, uh, actually, where am I? I want to get back to uh, slide number one to show my, my smiling face once again. I hope the Dow Theory for the 21st century will hold, serve you well, and I thank you for your interest and your kind attention, and good luck to you. And on behalf of the Market Technician Association, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Jack, for an excellent presentation. For those interested, this webcast will be archived in the on-demand video archives before the end of the week. I thank you all for attending today, and I hope you enjoy the remainder of your day.